This is Five Live Sport. Five Live Formula One. Verstappen picks up where he left off, Ferrari are playing the long game, and the Alonso hype train runs out of steam. For today, at least. I'm Jack Nichols, and this is the Checker Flag Podcast. Well, joining me to dissect that qualifying session, I have the former Mercedes F1 reserve driver, Sam Bird, current Formula E racer with Jaguar, and our pit lane reporter, Rosanna Tennant. Max Verstappen on pole, then Sergio Perez alongside him. Red Bull front row lockout. Should we all go home, Sam? <laughs> no, I, do you know what? I've really enjoyed this weekend so far because we arrived here, Jack, and everybody was saying it's over, it's done. Verstappen's going to win every single race and Red Bull will come first and second all the time. Especially Captain Optimism, Andrew Benson. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and it hasn't been like that at all. Um, I think you can not rip up the form book, but, uh, that, uh, you know, Max Verstappen, yeah, he's on pole, but it's super close and super exciting. I think Aston Martin joining the the sort of the top teams is a, a really exciting prospect for, for this year. Rosanna, it was, there was a lot of hype train I Fernando had a ticket Alonso. to ride. <laughs> I was on board. Coming into the session because suddenly it looked like maybe he was had a chance for pole. We all thought, we'll be going mad. We were going a little mad, right? I think we were still going mad off the back of testing because suddenly in FP1, he was second. And then FP2, he was top of the timesheets. And you just think, hang on a second, is this the real deal? And we've been chatting over the course of today, just going, where are we? What's happening? It's 2023. Fernando Alonso, is this really going to happen? Is he going to take pole? Is he a championship contender? I think he'll be a little bit disappointed that he didn't manage to finish it off on Saturday with pole position, because I think some people were maybe dreaming uh, of that for him. But he thought he dreamt a little bit too big and, of course, didn't manage to do it. But as Sam says, how exciting to have Aston Martin in the mix. Shame they couldn't get between the Ferraris. But hey, look, it's round one of 23, Jack. Yeah, it'll be Charles Leclerc third on the grid, Carlos Sainz fourth on the grid. Let's cover off Verstappen then, first of all, because he hadn't looked... I mean, he sounded quite... I'll tell you what, we'll hear from him first. Uh, Rosanna spoke to him after the session. Max, heading into qualifying, were you expecting to have the same problems you'd had in practice or do you thought you'd sort of ironed them out? Well, I just honestly didn't really know what to expect because everything we tried in practice was not really working. Um, so, yeah, I didn't know what was going to happen in qualifying. But luckily, I think what we did was, uh, was positive for qualifying, but it's still not exactly where I would like it to be. So there's way more in the car, you think? Well, I think we showed that already in testing. I was a lot happier with the car. So for sure there's a bit of margin to, uh, to do better. I mean, everyone will say that, but we have already shown that. So for sure uh, there are a few things to, uh, to look at before we uh, go to the next race. So he was quite relieved almost to get pole position because the weekend so far, Sam, hadn't been going his way. Well, I spoke to Christian Horner this morning and he said that Max just hasn't been comfortable with the car. And there it's needed the same to car be as a week ago when he was dominating. Yeah, but the track has changed and the conditions have changed. So it, it needed maybe a slightly different setup and maybe they tried some things and it hadn't worked. Anyway, clearly this evening they've dialed into something that has made it more drivable for him. And he was able to deliver because he is one of, if not the best driver in the world currently. But only a tenth of a second ahead of Sergio Perez. Yeah, I think Max wasn't happy in the car today. He's already talking about making changes for Saudi, that there is more to unlock from the car, which of course you expect at round one, there's always going to be something to improve. But I think he's already focusing on what they can tweak. And that to me says he wasn't comfortable today, which is ominous, isn't it really? How, how important was it for Red Bull that Perez got second on the grid? I think it's important considering when you think of the tyre strategy that um, Ferrari have employed. So Ferrari, Charles Leclerc, we were expecting a great fight between Charles Leclerc and Max Verstappen heading into the dying minutes of qualifying. And we didn't get that battle. Why didn't we get that battle? Well, because Charles Leclerc and Ferrari have decided, I think quite wisely, to save a set of brand new soft compound tyres for the start of tomorrow. A, because it gives them a better launch off the line, and B, because they understand and they know and recognise their weakness is tyre deg. But haven't Red Bull done the same? They didn't do a final run in Q2. Yeah, true. So was it reactive or was it proactive? I, I tried to get that out of Charles. Yeah, well, this is what Charles had to say. 
Michelle, heading into qualifying, what was your expectation? Were you hoping you could mix it with Red Bull or did you almost let them go as it were? No, I mean, I'm always very optimistic and uh, even in weekends that are very, very difficult and that realistically is very difficult to get pole, my mindset is to go and uh, try and do something special and put it on pole anyway. So uh, the goal was always to put it on pole. Um, but realistically, we knew that we were probably a step uh, behind, which to be honest, we were we were very strong, stronger than what we thought. So uh, this is a good surprise. We saw you get out of the car prematurely. I imagine to save tyres, was that in reaction to Red Bull not doing a final run in Q2? Or do you always plan to to save some at a later stage of qualifying? Uh, no, I. Uh, that was what I had planned. So yeah, no regrets. I'm happy with the choice we've done. Um, maybe we could have start P2 or maybe P1 because we were fast. But uh, yeah, uh, with the used tyres against a very strong Red Bull in, race, in, in the race, I think we did better uh, doing that choice. So fascinating tyre strategy going into the into the race. You still have to feel, don't you, that I, I take the point, I take the logic that you are going into the race with a fresh set of tyres, a, a set that you wouldn't have had if you'd have gone for pole position. You could have been on pole position. Surely, surely it's better. I know, and I'm starting to think, oh, no, please, let's not fall into the Ferrari 2022 trap. But Charles looked at me, his little eyes twinkling, and he said, I was happy with what we did. I'm, I'm pleased with how we've played this. So, look, if it works tomorrow, great, great decision. But if it doesn't, there are going to be uh, little chitter-chatters, aren't there, in the paddock. <laughs> oh, here we go again. Ferrari strategy. And you're sticking with great decision? Uh, we'll so find out so, tomorrow, no, etc. But, but so far, from what I've seen from Ferrari... Their, their decision-making seems more legitimate this year than last year. I think that it's always going to be under scrutiny. Um, and it's definitely going to be under scrutiny the first few races until they're stabilised a little bit with their new personnel. They've made a lot of changes, including, obviously, their team boss, Frederick Vasseur, who I really highly rate, by the way. I think he's a brilliant leader of men and he's a real racer. So there's new people in places in the strategy department, new people in place at the head of Ferrari. Let's see how they get on. But I do think that they've made some wise choices today. Is it all about getting splitting the Red Bulls at least off the line? Is, is that what is that the purpose of this of this or is it to play out later on in the Grand Prix or at least to give them options, I suppose? I think it gives them options. That's the thing. I think that if they'd use that tire, then they don't have they, they, they lose one option at least. Right now, they've, they've got a spare option and, and a, a spare card up their sleeve. Not, not saying that Red Bull don't, but then at least they're on the, on the same level playing field. But would you rather be starting at the front as a driver? <sighs> to be honest... It must be a tough one, you right? You don't want to win this race, though, do you? Well, yeah. The stats. The stats. You're like, actually, after you, you have this one, I'll take the title. <laughs> yeah, that's, right? yeah, that's yeah, good logic. I like it. <laughs> but it must be difficult for Leclerc, you know, four minutes left in qualifying. Right battle for pole position is on a tenth of a second away after the first run time to get out the car i mean the start is crucial here but you you can win from third i mean this is this is a race of longevity there's a lot of towing in this race and there's a lot of tire degradation so look he's he's right in the mix um i still fancy i will do the predictions later i'm not going to say that yeah, now yeah, we're not going to do, do yeah, we're not going to do that now but um he's he's most definitely there and where he needs to be Carlos Sainz lines up fourth on the uh, on the grid, and a, a reasonable performance from from Carlos Sainz. Certainly a lot happier now than 12 months ago when he had a really torrid time. Yeah, I think he was still struggling today, and I think it's a bit disappointing that he didn't start his campaign ahead of Charles if he was really going to like lay down the marker. But look, it's going to be a long race tomorrow, and I think you know if he can kind of mix it and keep his position and not let Fernando through, you know, his hero, his childhood hero, isn't that bizarre? Um, then I'll do well. But yeah, a bit of a shame not to just sort of stamp his authority and, and take the Ferrari bragging rights. So the front two rows of the grid, the two Red Bulls and the two Ferraris, we will move further back and uh, speak about everyone else in a couple of moments' time. Hello, I'm Tony Bellew and I am angry. As I can't take it out on people in the ring anymore, I'm going toe-to-toe -to -toe with some special guests to find out what makes them angry and, more importantly, how they deal with it. People think that 
Oh, you've got a boss life. You get to do what you love. Don't see the dark side of things. We're back for season three, and this time I'll be chatting to the likes of Michael B. Jordan, Paddy Pimlet, Duncan Ferguson, and Bugsy Malone. I didn't feel I should have been in prison. I wish the referee had given me a red card at the time because we wouldn't be talking about it just now. Tony Bellew is angry. Listen on BBC Sounds. So Red Bull 1-2 on the grid. Max Verstappen ahead of Sergio Perez for the Bahrain Grand Prix. Row 2 will be the Ferraris of Charles Leclerc ahead of Carlos Sainz. And then in fifth place, the man that we've all put so much energy into in the last 22 years of, uh, of Formula 1, Fernando Alonso. All the talk, Rosanna, of can he take pole position? Is he really in the fight? And he wasn't quite in the end was did he did he seem disappointed to you no he's so buoyant he's so happy to be in the team and i think from what he's saying you know this is the baseline this is what we are now going to have to expect from aston martin p5 or above and actually anything else perhaps will be a disappointment going into the season uh, a little further and he said tomorrow if he can just secure p5 then that's worth a little bit of celebration as well let's hear from him Fernando, what a weekend, well, what a start to the season with a brand new team. Can you just tell me what it's like to finally jump in a car that's going to potentially make you a championship contender? Well, um, I don't know, it felt, it felt obviously very good and, and very uh, happy uh, with the car from day one. Easy to drive, easy to understand what uh, the car was uh, requiring from, from the driver. Um, and yeah, as I said, this is just a starting point. I think this team is very, very motivated into the future. The project looks, you know, amazing with all the talented people that we have now in the team. Uh, so I think there are a lot of things coming into this car and it will get, just get better and better. So uh, we have a good baseline, a good plat platform to work on. Um, but I think there is a lot more to come from us. Oh, exciting. And a lot of people, I think, had their hopes up for a pole position from you today. <laughs> oh, I was too optimistic. <laughs> Can they get their hopes up for a podium tomorrow? Let's see. I think uh, if, if the conditions obviously are um, tomorrow into high degradation or something like that, I think we have a good car uh, on that regard. So we could have a chance. But to be honest, it's, it's even like dreaming too big you know if we can secure this position and, and be in the top five and see the checkered flag on the top five that will be a, a celebration it has to be a celebration for us so let's keep the feet in the ground and, and do our job tomorrow execute the race with no mistakes and let's see and i think sam they have to be sort of realistic it's all very well for us to get carried away about is alonso back at the front but he's a smart enough guy to know that you don't go from last to first unless you're brawn in 2009. I was just about <laughs> yeah. to remind you of that. Yeah, exactly. You don't really get that in, uh, you know, modern F1, as it were. And a fifth place would be, a fifth place on merit would be a, a really great result for this Aston Martin team. Fernando Alonso would say that in, in the bullpen, and he would say that to the media and the press and the journalists. Let me tell you, Fernando Alonso is the most tenacious, ferocious driver out there. And he will want to go forwards tomorrow. He, he's, he's thinking of a podium. He's going to go to bed tonight thinking of a podium, 100%. Is he going to get it? Oh, I don't know. He was talking about not dreaming too big, or rather he dreamt a bit too big. But I think, I think this paddock is behind him because I think they want him mixing it right at the front. Do you not think that? Well, I you feel like there is support. I think that they've set the car up very much for a high degradation race tomorrow. So... If you look at the stats from minimum speeds during qualifying, Fernando Alonso is all over the minimum speeds. He tops every single corner minimum speed on the circuit, bar none. So there's a, there's a reason why he must be slower, and that's either more drag or more downforce. So I think that the Aston Martin clearly has a little bit more downforce. That should help them with tyre deg, and that could play a factor in trying to beat at least maybe one Red Bull or maybe one or two Ferraris come tomorrow afternoon. And also perhaps it's just got a better working window. It's got a bit of a broader working window, whereas maybe other cars on the extreme are struggling, whereas maybe Aston Martin have just got a bit more to play with. Why are we now, this is a deep question, why oh, I'm are not ready we now for this. so excited <laughs> about Fernando Alonso when he's been the pantomime villain for so many years? And we, you know, we spoke about it coming into the weekend a, a little bit when we still weren't sure quite how quick the Aston Martin would be. But he's been the pantomime villain for so many years. Even when he came back to Alpine, everyone's a bit like, oh, Alonso's back again. He should have stayed retired. You know, Piastri could have had that seat. 
then, okay, he gets, a, was it front row or third on the grid in Canada or something, and everyone's a bit happier. Why? Now he's at the front. Everyone's like, oh, he's my favorite driver. He's everyone's favorite driver all of a sudden. Where he was everyone's least favorite driver when he was back at McLaren and GP2 <laughs> engine. And everyone's like, oh, just get lost, Fernando. If you want to do IndyCar, go do IndyCar. Where, how, how has it been such a, a turnaround in, you know, in, in, in love? For Alonso, we all have he's a fairy trouble, tale. He's trouble. Why is it? It's not a fairy, it's fairy tale. tale if, he's if, a bit if the man older. Who, like it, it ruined is, McLaren no, and then messed up Rosanna, Ferrari. I agree with Rosanna. It, it is a bit of a fairy tale. This guy is in his forties, and this guy can. Com- and this guy. So, can com- <laughs> so as soon as a baddie gets older, we start to like him. You might like me when I get to forty and form Marie yeah, and start everything. supporting yeah, yeah, me. Yeah, 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 so yeah, anything can happen. It's that phrase we always say, isn't it? Like, there's life in the old dog yet. There's always been, when we see a little bit of attacking spirit from Fernando, which I don't think it's ever lost, everyone's like, oh, it's so good to see, you know, he's still fighting and he's still hungry for it. And this is just kind of putting that out there in real real wouldn't, form. Wouldn't it be great? I mean, really, wouldn't it be great if he's got one more in him? I mean, he got two early on in his he's career. He's made enemies up and down the paddock. But he's he made enemies in every team he's got but, to, and suddenly we think this guy's a hero. No, but wouldn't it be a story? I mean, literally 20 years apart. That's got to be some record. I don't think anybody's had that big a wait for a title between, between two of them. I think it would be such a good story. Such a cool story. I, I can't see it happening. I want to believe that him being competitive is possible, and they're proving that. I think a title right now is a step too far. But what Aston Martin are building right now is a, a great foundation to, to go on and become more and more competitive as maybe this era of Formula One continues. When Max Verstappen took that first win in Spain in 2016, who would have thought that Max Verstappen would be going for his third world title, potentially up against Fernando Alonso also up for his third title in 2023? Yeah. Mad. Yeah, that's wild. I like that. No, I just, I just, and I'm, look, I'm not against Fernando Alonso. I think, oh yeah, come I think on. That, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> I think the, I think the guy's a genius behind the wheel. Don't get me wrong, and uh, you know he, he's super. But it's just really interesting to me how the how the paddock narrative changes from one of the most sort of not not disliked is the wrong word, but most sort of like <sighs> bored of. You know, people sort of got a bit bored of the sort of Alonso shtick a little, and he's cutting corners. He's just like, oh, GP2, oh, just whatever. Now in a team owned by Lawrence Stroll, who everyone's like, oh, he's just bought his kid a team and pumped a load of money in, and this isn't, you know, necessarily what we want in Formula One, and you know, a lot of derision has come there of the Stroll family entering Formula One and pumping all the money in. All of a sudden, this little duo are the darlings of the of the paddock. I just find that that sort of narrative turnaround really fascinating. I, I just think that everybody's super happy that there's another team to fight the top three. It's just exciting. It adds a new element to it. It, it Formula One, as exciting as it is as a sport, um, as high octane as it is, and, and with the introduction of certain shows on certain platforms, it's become even bigger than it ever was before. But there's only ever three teams that can ever win a race. Wouldn't it be nice if there's a fourth? Oh, Fernando Alonso's now got a competitive car. Yes, we're going to support him because it adds a different... It adds something new, Jack. Would it he adds be, a new element to this whole paddock. If you were to add a new element into the to the Mercedes, Red Bull, Ferrari story, is this the number one you would choose? Do you know what I mean? Or would you rather have Albin in a Williams Going for his there, first. Or, or would you have like a Norris in a McLaren? I think the this is kind of the best to me the sort of not best possible option but the most kind of dramatic option to yes i agree with most dramatic to sort of finish off his f1 career wouldn't that be great for him to end on a high we've got years of the lando norris's the alex albons let's hope whereas this is sort of almost the nice little uplift at the end of a career we thought that in 2016 Rosanna. i know i know i know, I know, I know. <laughs> it's like it's, it's like the last politics. dance yeah <laughs> it, it's like the last dance isn't it oh, don't, um, that'll be the new documentary for yeah. f1 now <laughs> do you know what i mean though but um it is exciting. It definitely is. And, and there, there's so many different narratives up and down this this paddock and so many talking points. I love the fact that the, the, the mid-pack looks like it's separated by two tents. Yeah. There's 10 cars within two tents. When have we had a season recently where we've started the year th- with so many cars in such close proximity? Well, in that mid-pack... Well, not quite. Just staying out of the mid-pack are Mercedes, George Russell and Lewis Hamilton. And Rosanna spoke to Hamilton after qualifying. Was today about damage limitation and how much damage do you think you've 
prevented yourself from incurring over the course of the weekend? Uh, no, it's not about damage limitation. I mean, we're, we've only just it's our first qualifying, so it's just about trying to see where we stand. And um, we're, I think, closer than I thought we would be, probably. Um, it was strange. It, it, it was strange for us to be like third and fourth at some stages, and P1 for a second, and like we didn't. I didn't expect us to be up there. So. And in terms of tomorrow, you can overtake on a track like this, but have you got the car to make those passes, do you think? Um, I don't know. If, I don't think we've got the car to overtake the guys ahead necessarily, but we'll give our, our best shot. Mercedes were another who weren't, well, well it's, this weekend, <laughs> let me tell you guys, this weekend's been such a roller coaster in the paddock because we've had pre-season testing. Everyone comes in thinking they know what's happening. And then every practice session has torn up the form book from um, testing and everyone's been very confused and motorsport journalists up and down the paddock from every publication have been going oh well no this isn't quite what we expected this is a bit weird and then and Lewis Hamilton says yesterday we're on the wrong path we've got no pace and then in free practice three he's two tenths off for Stappen so everyone's been very confused ultimately though with Mercedes they were kind of where we thought they were going to be in the end I think so. I think the changes overnight have brought them up to where they thought they were. They were behind yesterday. I don't think they actually pushed them on ahead. I think they just caught them up to where they uh, okay. had worried they were, almost, if that makes sense. Yeah. And actually, when I was on my way to the pit lane for Quali, I had a quick chat with Mike Elliott and said, all OK, you know, how are we looking? Uh, and he said, uh, obviously you, not me. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Mike Elliott, how am I looking? I, mean, yeah, I, got, exactly. I know I'm only radio for this weekend, but I'd just like a quick, you know, outfit check. Yeah, I need a moral moral boost, morale yeah, boost. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, he said, you know, we've, we worked on things overnight, so it's not going to be too bad. This is but, him now speaking, this isn't yeah, you. Yeah, this was my, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah okay. I'd also worked on things overnight, but it's still bad. The outlook's still bad. Um, but yeah, I don't think it pushed them on further. I think it just remedied some of the, the issues they were having yesterday. Sixth and seventh on the grid, what can they do tomorrow? I, I'm not holding out much hope for much better. Although last year they were very good at extracting the absolute maximum out of race performance and and picking up places when other people make mistakes. Um, so when last year, predictably, Ferrari would make a mistake, Mercedes would be there to pounce. They're going to need something like that in order to move forwards. Um, because I think everybody in front of them will continue to finish in front of them. I don't think they've got much more to give out of that package. I've I found their performance this weekend so far really strange. I haven't really understood it. Um, but let's see. You know, it's a long season. I think that they there's there's going to they're going to need to make decisions on that car and that package uh, and the aero package that they've got in the next couple of weeks. Well, the upgrade to Steve Rimmler, uh, right? That's yeah, what otherwise the, the season could be gone before you know it. So, they will be sixth and seventh on the grid. Eighth will be Lance Stroll, who has had quite a tumultuous uh, week. It was quite nice, Two actually. Two weeks. In the media pen, um, the other drivers were coming up, and first of all, it was Fernando giving Lance a big hug, saying, well done. And then it was Esteban Ocon coming over and saying, well done. He said it in French, yeah, mon pote, my friend. Um, but obviously, they're all kind of a sort of understanding of what it's taken for Lance to get back in the cockpit after his bike injury. So he revealed after qualifying today, or I don't know if it was earlier on, but it's literally just popped up on my, on my phone, but he broke his big toe as well on his right foot and couldn't walk. When he when he left, hence the flip flops that hence we the saw. Flip -flops. Ah, hence the flip flops yes. yesterday. Flip we thought Detective Nichols and Bell. <laughs> may we, may we? <laughs> no, we saw him kind of walking. We, we Sam even said to me, "God, Stroll walks a bit funny, doesn't he?" <laughs> and I said, "Oh, but look, he's got flip flops on, so that's why." Because obviously, you kind of shoot along. There's a there's a joke flip about a flip flop along. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You sort of flip flop along, and it was a bit of an odd you know, decision, but fine, whatever. You know, maybe he's just come out the spa or just had a little massage in the motorhome, whatever. But that would kind of explain that a little bit if he if he broke his big toe as well. So eighth on the grid, fine. Half a second of Alonso as he has been all weekend. We'll just have to see what happens. We can, we can, we can give him a sort of bye for this weekend, surely. Miss preseason oh, testing. Right. Very he's got kind a broken of you. toe. How very kind of you. He's got a broken wrist. That's yeah, that's been what I mean. So we're not going to sit here. Something and... else on the other wrist, a broken toe, and you're going to give him a bye. Yeah, no, we're oh, not. Oh, that's gonna... really kind. I'm not going to say being half a second yeah. off the pace, not good enough. I'm not going to sit here saying that. He's fine. 
He's, <laughs> he, he was not. He not. He's fine. He was fine today. He was yeah. fine. Uh, Ocon ninth, <laughs> fine. Hulkenberg did well to get into the to get into the top ten in, in Q3. I thought. Um, anything to add? No, I think I think Nico Hulkenberg deserves a massive shout out today. You know, he's been out of full time Formula One driving for what is it, three seasons, yeah, maybe even four that. seasons. Yeah. Now, r rewind a year, and it was Kevin Magnussen that came to this circuit after having a couple of years out himself and delivered on an absolutely incredible weekend, finishing P5 in the race, and really showcasing just why he was needed back in Formula One and why Haas re-employed him. Yeah. But now it's completely the opposite. So um, Kevin Kevin struggled for pace over the last 48 hours. And, and you know, um, yeah, he's down in 17th place with, with Nico Hülkenberg up in the top 10. Kudos to, to uh, Nico Hülkenberg. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, I mean, look... <laughs> The man beat Jolien Palmer over the course of three quarters of a season. Like you can't, you can't be surprised when he does. He's got well. talent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, McLaren looked in big trouble at the, uh, the first running Q1. They were seventeenth and eighteenth, I think. Norris. Yeah. I feel we, how we, what were you expecting to find from Norris and what did you find? Well, we were all talking sort of doom and gloom as we came into the Bahrain race weekend, weren't we? We were like, oh, McLaren are going to be on the back row. It's going to be awful. They're going to be battling with Williams. But actually, to finish eleventh. I think it was a good session from Lando's point of view. I think Oscar made a few mistakes and he's put his hands up on, on that one. But I think, you know, he's learning Formula One. He's learning a new car. He hasn't been in comp competitive racing for a long time, over a year. Um, so actually, Lando had a pretty good result there, but he needs to push into the points. And I'm not sure if that car can, can stay there. Yeah, McLaren are bringing, well, they, they need to, they're already said that they're not hitting their targets already this season. So points appears to be the the target now which is a shame considering where they were a couple of years ago and a shame for Norris considering his you know stock in F1 and all of that exactly Norris's stock up and down this pit lane is amazing and I think all the top teams would bite their hand off to get his services in their car um, which makes it quite difficult for him internally you know if, if McLaren don't deliver him a top car he's going to get very frustrated and if then he gets frustrated, he might not drive at his best. And then if Oscar Piastri is is this, you know, young, hungry rookie, you could get into a situation where you've got a, a, a slightly annoyed Norris not delivering, an overachieving Piastri, and Lando could, his stock could fall quite quickly. I'm not saying that that is going to happen because I, I think he's too good for that to happen. Um, I think he's one of the best drivers out there currently. Um, but... You know, let's hope the McLaren can find something because it's not, it's not particularly good for them right now. Bottas and Joe, twelfth and thirteenth for Alfa Romeo. Yuki Tsunoda, fourteenth for uh, Alfa Tauri. Albon, fifteenth, and the bottom five: Sargent, Magnussen, Piastri, De Vries, and Gasly. All of the rookies getting out qualified by their by their teammates on their debut. Well, not exactly a debut for for Nick De Vries, but his second time out. And uh, well they'll just all be a bit disappointed. No, I'm I'm actually heartened by Williams' performance because yeah. I think we had them as yeah, back true. of the grid, right? And actually, to finish 15th and 16th and Logan Sargent, rookie, I think that's good. I think it was um, actually all right. He was two tenths slower than Albon in Q1. Not bad. Obviously, Albon's another guy with high stock. Yeah, I think I think Sargent's done a, a strong job today. Remember, he... He, the only reason why I didn't make it through to Q2 is because Lando Norris did his lap time just before he crossed the line. They did the same time, Jack, within within the thousandth of a second. I mean, that's just think that this circuit is nearly six kilometres long and you, you deliver the same lap time to within a thousandth of a second. It's remarkable, this sport, sometimes. Um, so I think, I think Logan Sargent wins the award for best rookie of the day. Um... I think that Nick de Vries has had the most difficult day of all the rookies to be fairly convincingly beaten by Yuki Tsunoda. Yeah, absolutely. Right. That kind of covers off uh, qualifying. Thank you very much for joining us for the pod. We'll be back tomorrow for a post-race podcast, but you know that because you've already uh, subscribed to this pod, haven't you? Or come back to BBC Sounds. Do you want to do predictions, nod or shake your heads? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, absolutely. fine. Absolutely, why not? Well, go on then. 
Oh, well, you were looking at... All oh, right, why don't you go first? Oh, because I, I don't you like predictions. Oh, um, I don't know. You just want to go third so you can hear our knowledge oh, and expertise. Yeah, 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 and then yeah. you can copy us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fine. I'll go... Um, I just have a feeling it's not going to be... I just have a feeling it's not going to be a, a Verstappen win. I don't. I don't know why. I, why? I think a mechanical failure. Yeah, or something a meteor. like that. Or <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like, what's going to happen? None of us will be here. Herds of wildebeest will <laughs> yeah. sweep majestically across the circuit, <laughs> causing a red flag. Um, I just get the feeling not Verstappen. Okay, okay. I'm going to predict not Verstappen. How's that? How's On that the podium for a prediction? at all. Okay. Zero points for Verstappen. That's oh my prediction. God. I don't know. Oh my God. That's going to be like God. taken out the first oh, turn or something. Controversial. Oh, fine, fine, fine. Verstappen oh. for the win then. Fine. What do you think? <laughs> um, Actually, no, let Rosanna you, you go. You cracked under pressure, Nicole. <laughs> yes, this is how first I exist. Round. <laughs> this is how I exist. <laughs> Rosanna. I'm going to go Max Verstappen, Charles Leclerc, Fernando Alonso. I'm going to go Max Verstappen to win. I'm then going to go with... Charles Leclerc second. I'm then going to go an intense battle between Sergio Perez and Fernando Alonso, but Sergio Perez to come out in third. Okay. Oh. And Fernando Alonso to just narrowly avoid you've, it. You've predicted a podium for Alonso all weekend until now. I just... What happened know, today that changed your my mind? My glass is feeling... I'm, I'm hungry and my glass is half empty. That's why I said... No, I'm hungry too. That's why I said let's not do predictions. We could finish this pod two minutes earlier and be eating two minutes earlier. But, look, we but you, were, you were desperate we're, to do them. We're giving the, the viewers some value for money. Yeah, listeners, but I'll take let's it. Let's hope they're not filming this. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> right, uh, this has been an IMG production for BBC Radio 5 Live. Qualifying complete. You can listen to the race tomorrow on BBC Radio Sports Extra. Uh, BBC Radio 5 Sports Extra gets underway at quarter to three in the UK, quarter to six local time here in Bahrain. And we'll be back with another episode of the Checker Flag podcast after the Grand Prix. Speak to you tomorrow.